pedagogical um, discussion of expansion and its implications and also its dynamics. And I will try today to get to the point where we can scroll back time far enough to the past that we hit sort of the domain of particle physics, which is the topic of this school, and discuss some implications of that. And wherever I get to in this lecture and maybe part of the next lecture, there I stop this pedagogical introduction for the for, And for the sake of people who have some more advanced backgrounds, I will just go to state-of-the-art calculations, specific concrete calculations that connect to state-of-the-art measurements and constraints. So I'll do a few examples of that. So that's my plan. So we're continuing pedagogical this hour. Um, and then we go out there, but using the basic formalism that we've developed. So those of you who do not have advanced background will have more pedagogical foundations. And those who do will have state-of-the-art connections in the rest. OK. So I finished the previous lecture discussing the gas of galaxies. Okay. And uh, as we said, so this gas is consistent with being spatially homogeneous and isotropic. And just to remind you what it means, um, so spatially homogeneous means that if you take a slice in time, in universe time, then wherever you walk, in this walk around in the universe in this gas of galaxies, what you, um, wherever you walk, you see the same concentration, the same physical properties of this gas of galaxies. And again, also to, to point out that a slice in time means in a plot like that, really a slice in universe times means, means a slice in redshift. Because you see this is redshift here. We've related redshift to the scale factor. So we wrote the expansion scale factor. We define it as physical distances on this map are related by some time-dependent scale factor to a coordinate distance or co-moving distance, which refers all specified points on this map. Okay? And we've related, we've, we've written a relation between the evolution of the scale factor to the energy or temperature of photons or the wavelength of photons. This is called cosmological redshift. And we just define the relation that A is defined to be 1 over 1 plus Z, where Z has the usual definition of redshift. <coughs> so since this scale factor is a function of time, as we will derive, a slice in time is a slice in redshift. And it just means that light emitted from galaxies at a slice in redshift from all the galaxies here is emitted at the same universe time, so at the same universe Z factor. And I will be using interchangeably um, time, scale factor A, and redshift as labels of universe time. Okay? They are both sense in a uniform, homogeneous isotropic universe. This A is just a function of time, not a function of where you are in the universe. Then it's just as good a label of time. As long as it is monotonous, its evolution is monotonous, it's just as good label for time as time is, <laughs> if you want. Okay, so the stage of the evolution of the universe. Good, so homogeneous means we walk in a slice in redshift wherever we look in three-dimensional space, wherever we walk in this slice of time, we see the same thing. Isotropic means we stand in a point, we look in all directions, we see the same thing wherever we look. And if isotropicity is not just a property of our special point, but it's a property of the other, other locations in the universe and other times, we're not special in this sense, then homogeneity is guaranteed. Okay, so isotropicity is strong. And I wanted to start to discuss the dynamics of the evolution of the scale factor by considering, <coughs> given this snapshot of the gas of galaxies and the information in this snapshot is A, the density, the mass density in these galaxies, so the number density and the mass of each galaxy, and B, the fact that, as you saw, these galaxies are all receding from us on average. They have small peculiar or thermal motions, like thermal motions of particles of air in this room. So they have small thermal motions, but on top of the thermal motion, there is a bigger, as you go farther away, it becomes bigger um, flow called the Hubble flow, which is this Hubble expansion. So we said that locally, all of these galaxies are seen to have a Doppler effect such that the velocity for a point 
one of these galaxies at distance r from us, okay, is proportional to its distance. Okay? And from a measurement like this, you saw the, the correlation, the linear correlation, we get a number just from this recession for this uh, coefficient. This is called the Hubble um, constant, even though, as we said, it's not a constant. We'll calculate it shortly. And this is roughly measured to be 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Maybe it was just flashing the plot where we saw it. Right. So here is uh, the correlation between the distance of one of those galaxies from us and the velocity at which it is seen to, to recede from us by measuring the Doppler effect. Okay, so, and the slope here, you see 72, is just this Hubble knot coefficient that I wrote. And these are relatively nearby galaxies, so they're measuring the very recent history of the universe. They're measuring Hubble knot, which is this coefficient at time t naught today. Good. And there are strong implications to this expansion. As you saw, uh, the energy of photons redshifts, a photon seen at energy E gamma today, was, must have been emitted earlier in the time of the universe with a higher energy, higher by a factor of one plus z, or one over a. So it's really important, if we want to understand the particle dynamics of a universe, particle physics collisions depends on energy of the constituent particles. Okay? So if we scroll back time, all these soft symbi photons we see around us have been more energetic, energetic enough that all kinds of particle physics reaction will change because the initial states will be more energetic. So it's really crucial for us as particle physics physicists to understand how, this, how to scroll back this time, um, this evolution. Okay? And we'll do it with the gas of galaxies. <coughs> And I've already set out the picture for you. So imagine that to analyze this gas of galaxies, not equipped with general relativity yet, we don't want to use GR explicitly yet, what we can do, we can take a, a ball or a, a ball out of this presumably infinite universe, okay, homogeneous and isotropic universe. So let us choose, say, ourselves as the center of the sphere that we want to analyze. And we cut out a sphere of radius r out of this large universe, and we cut it out at one universe time, at some slice in time t naught. Okay? So in other words, we have our uniform gas of galaxies at some universe time, oops, t. We choose a center of coordinates for this uniform gas of galaxies. This choice is arbitrary. We can choose us, conveniently, to connect to observations. And we cut out an imaginary shell, radial shell, with radius r around us. And this shell is completely imaginary. Okay? So I just, I'm just choosing to separate in my mind the rest of the universe from whatever is inside. And then we said that there is a theorem we want to analyze the dynamics of the gas of galaxies in this universe, and we have a theorem to, in our disposal which says that all of these galaxies outside of, the radial, of a radial shell, as long as they are uniformly distributed, cannot affect the gravitation, the dynamics inside of this shell. Okay? We're only including gravitation in our, in our analysis. So we have a theorem that says uh, need only consider consider distances smaller than our imaginary shell. But the matter inside, we do have to consider. For the GR persons among you, this, this theorem, the Birkhoff theorem says that the metric induced by the matter outside is Minkowski. There is only the flat solution inside of this shell coming from the matter outside, so it's enough to consider the matter inside. And now we're going to endow our sphere with what we see, which is a homogeneous and isotropic expanding initial condition. Okay, so we will choose for this sphere um, homogeneous and isotropic expanding initial conditions. What do I mean by that? I mean that at time t naught, 
we will let the density throughout the universe, in particular in our sphere, the density of these galaxies, the mass density, be equal to a uniform density rho naught inside our sphere. That's the first assumption that we make, consistent with observations. Second assumption that we make is that we endow this sphere with expansion according to the Hubble law. So in other words, we say that our dot, okay, so let us look at a particle sitting at the edge of our sphere, and we want to give it an initial velocity, and consistent with what we see, we'll give it an initial velocity outwards. We could have done the same thing with the collapsing universe. We let it expand because that's what we see. So, and it, it will expand with the Hubble law. So R dot at T naught will be edge naught R at T naught. And let us further specify that this is edge naught R naught. So R at T naught is R naught. And now what we want to do, we want to calculate the orbit. We want to compute R of T with these initial conditions. And we will do it with Newtonian physics. Because that's what we have. And actually, there is no work. This is one of these cases where no work at all is needed. The only thing that is needed is to write the correct equation and then look at it for a while. And the relevant equations, or the, the, most, the, easy, the easiest equation to write for this example is just the total energy. So imagine that each of these particles in the gas, so we will say that each galaxy, galaxy has mass m. And the right equation to put down here is the total energy for the galaxy, some one of the galaxies sitting on this shell at r equal r naught at t naught. And we want to follow the trajectory of this galaxy, so let's write the total energy. Energy of galaxy at r. Of t. So this total energy, and let me write the energy per unit mass. It will be convenient for us. So this total energy has a contribution from the negative gravitational binding energy um, that is um, applied to this mass from the concentration of mass below it. And again, we can ignore everything outside. So there is a negative gravitational energy, which is g m of R over R, it's a gravitational energy per unit mass, where by M of R I just mean the mass enclosed in this volume. Okay, so we have mass enclosed. Which is an integral from zero to R for pi dr r squared rho of R. And for our situation, r is a function of t. And rho is also a function of t. I suppress these um, dependencies here in this integral, okay? So that's the negative gravitational energy. But because of our initial conditions and without coordinate system, this mass also has kinetic energy. So it has kinetic energy given by r dot squared over two, as long as these velocities are small. Okay, so that's the kinetic energy per unit mass. That we have. Now we are doing Newtonian physics, and this is gravity. The motion of this galaxy is fully determined by gravity. And Newtonian gravity, definitely in this example, this gravity is conservative, meaning that the energy per particle in this motion is conserved. Okay, so this, in particular, energy per unit mass is conserved. It's equal to a constant, meaning that even though all of these radii are functions of t, 
and the velocity is a function of time, this sum has to be constant under Newtonian motion. Okay? Now, it's a constant, but it definitely depends at this point, this constant would depend with my initial conditions on the particular mass shell that I took. In particular, it will depend on R0. So remember that R at T0, we define it to be R0. So where I chose this coordinate to stand at the beginning of time, um, or the, the initial time of the evolution, um, affects this E. Oh, so the question is, if I get it right, if we've neglected angular motion? We have. So we are assuming our initial condition contained no motion in the angular direction, only radial motion, which is the only thing we were allowed to do with isotropic initial conditions. And there is no force that is going to induce angular motion, okay? So angular motion will never be excited. We are safe to ignore it. Yes. Okay, so this energy is a constant on the orbit of my particle, but it does depend on the initial position of my particle. So, to see how it depends on the initial condition of my particles, and because it's constant, let us just compute this energy at our initial time, T naught, okay? So we can compute this at T naught. Not, and we find that E over M, so at T over T naught with my initial condition for the density, note that M of R naught is just 4 pi over 3 rho naught R naught cubed. Okay. If I plug it in here, then my initial conditions is minus 4 pi G over 3 rho naught R naught squared, because the R naught in here cancels one power over R naught, plus H naught squared, R naught squared, over two. And there we have it, okay? This means that the energy per unit mass, let me write it in a slightly different way, so twice the energy per unit mass divided by R naught squared, let's write what it is, two E, over m r naught squared is equal to h naught squared minus 8 pi g over 3 rho naught. So even though the energy per unit mass does depend on my initial location of my shell, the energy over r naught squared is proportional to my uniform initial conditions. Okay, so this number h naught and this density rho naught they were the same inside of my initial shell, okay? So this is a homogeneous constant. It's a constant because it's given by the initial conditions. By definition, it's not a function of time. And it's homogeneous by my initial conditions too. Okay, so this is just a constant. It's the same for every shell. And I can give it a very telling name. Let me give it a very telling name. I will call this constant minus k, okay? So it tells you nothing some of you at least, um, but it's the common terminology for this constant. Okay, good. Second thing um, we would like to ask is our initial conditions were homogeneous and isotropic. Does the evolution remain uniform? Does the evolution remain homogeneous and isotropic? In particular, it's not completely obvious at this stage that even though I started with a density that is the same everywhere, okay, the raw density was the same everywhere, does the density remain uniform as I move on my trajectory? And to see this, the most convenient thing is to go back to our nice parameterization here and say that my R of t parameterized the motion of my orbit as R naught times A of t, define my scale factor, and this means that A of t naught is chosen to be unity, okay? 
So this I can do. Now, at this point in our life, it is not obvious that the scale factor A is not a function of R0. In other words, to be really honest, what I should write here is a function of time, but also potentially a function of my initial condition. So if the function A, the growth factor, the scale factor, which is clearly a function of time, if it's also a function of my initial shell position, then this shell will expand differently in time. Maybe they will collide and cross, etc., and our life will be complicated. And in particular, if this is a function of the initial shell, so it's different, the function here and the function here are different, the density will not remain uniform, okay? But I will drop this because uh, what I want to show now is that in fact, this A is not a function of this R0. And to show it, the easiest thing to do, can you see if I write here, can everybody see if I write here? Okay, so the easiest thing to do is to now evaluate my constant again, <coughs> um, but now just using um, the initial conditions for the mass and this definition of A. So initial condition for the mass, what I mean is, as long as my shells will not cross each other, okay, but when they cross, we will see something catastrophic will happen to, my, to our equations if the shells cross. If the shell that started here and the, the shell that started here cross, we'll have some catastrophic implications. We will see some singularity. As long as this doesn't happen, then it means that the mass enclosed below this point that started at R0 is conserved. Okay, so this particle is moving on some orbit, radial orbit, okay, it can go out, it can go back. All the shells below it follow, if they don't cross it, then the mass enclosed is conserved, meaning that our M of R, or M of R of T, is conserved and it's equal to M at R0, okay? So it's always four pi g over three rho naught r naught cubed. Just the conservation of mass without shell crossings. And now let me use that and my definition of the scale factor. Okay, so if I use that, so e over m is minus k r naught squared over two. So minus k r naught squared over two just writing E over M here, okay? It's a homogeneous constant, and that is minus four pi G over three rho naught R naught cubed. What I wrote here is minus G M, using the fact that M is conserved. And what I have down here, if I use my scale factor, is A of T times R naught down here, okay? And then I want to add my kinetic energy. My kinetic energy is just A dot of T squared over two R naught squared, okay? And I can cancel one R naught in here and I have a squared. So all I want from this equation at this point is to point out that I have an R naught squared here, R naught squared here, and R naught squared here. Let's delete them. And what you're left with is minus K over two is minus four pi G, G rho naught over three A of T plus A dot of T squared over two, the point is that this equation lost all memory of R0, okay? So the equation of motion for the function A has no memory of the initial shell. So we got what we want, in fact. Expansion is uniform, we proved it, because the evolution equation for the function doesn't remember anything about the initial shell that I wrote. You can easily convince yourself, I, use, I let you do it, if it's not obvious to you, you can convince yourself that an expansion of this form keeps the density uniform, okay? Or homogeneous. Okay, so we prove the density is homogeneous. So rho of t is not a function of, is not function of r. 
of t. It's uniform, it's just a function of time. But this means that my enclosed mass, I can just write it now as a function of the actual physical coordinate. So I can also write that my enclosed mass is 4 pi g over 3 rho of t r of t cubed. Okay? And that's it. That's all we need. It's the same equation we started with. We can just write it in a different way. Let me write it over there because I'm prone to erasing things. And this I can erase already without damage, I think. Okay, so if we pack everything together and using this row that is just a function of time, I can rewrite the initial equation and it says let us, for convenience, set for now r not equal to 1, just because we don't care what it is. So this says minus k over 2 equals minus 4 pi g over 3, just writing the mass here, and I have an R cubed, cancelling this R. So I have rho. Rho is a function of time, okay, I won't say it, times A squared, okay, plus A dot squared over 2. And this I can reshuffle a little bit and I get that A dot over A squared is just 8 pi g over 3 rho minus k over a squared. This is just the same equation we started with, but we've proven that homogeneity and isotropy is kept I intact in this framework, and we have derived an equation for the scale factor a that depends on some constant. This constant we can interpret physically, this constant uh, as we saw, it's just proportional to minus the total energy per unit mass for any of these particles in the ball that we started with. So that was our constant k. It's a function of the initial conditions. So when you measure this gas of galaxies over here, you can calculate what this number is. Okay? You measure the density. You measure this, the velocity at which locally the galaxies are escaping, so you know this number. Yes? You know the mass density of these galaxies, and you can just calculate what this constant is. It's a function of initial conditions. It's observable. And once you've computed this constant from the initial conditions, and you know the density, you can use it to calculate the motion of the scale factor. Any questions so far? <clears throat> yes? Ah, I just rearranged the equation to bring it to the, the, um, the well-known form of this equation. So what I did, I took this equation, unless you find a mistake in what I said. So I moved this thing to the left, multiplied by 2 to get the 8 pi g. All right. This one? Ah, so here what I wanted, so it's the same equation, you can check. It's just, a, and it's equally applicable in principle. You can use it, it's equally good. It's just that this is a more well-known form. So this, I just used the initial conditions for the mass. So initially, what I did here, and I didn't do here, I derived in this case. What I did here, I used the fact that the initial condition is homogeneous. So, and mass conservation tells me I can just plug the mass in here, the initial mass. So all I wanted from this representation of the same equation was to point out that the evolution equation for A is independent of distance. Okay, but it's equally good if you want. But in this form, this equation is known as the Friedman equation. One of two of them. We'll derive the second one in a heartbeat. Okay, so let me erase this. So we have an equation for our galaxies.
good. To solve this equation, we have two functions of time in this equation and measurable initial conditions. The functions of time that we have are rho of t and a of t, okay? So we have one equation and two functions of time, so we need another equation. We already used it, in fact, even though we didn't have to. So the other, the other equations that we need to solve this system is some equation for rho dot, the time derivative of this rho. <clears throat> and to get it, so for a gas of galaxies, because we saw that there are no shell crossings, expansion re remains homogeneous and isotropic, then the number of galaxies in the volume is conserved. And this means that I get an equation for rho just saying that rho times a cubed must be a constant. This just says that the total number of galaxies multiplied by the mass per galaxy in a unit coordinate volume is constant, okay? And this I can write, so keeping in mind that everything in this problem is just a function of time label t, it means that dA, for instance, can be traded for dt, okay? So I can say that since dA can be written as a dot dt and so on, all differentials of everything are only always proportional to a differential of time, okay? And this can be written to say that rho dot, and let me put a label m because we've used particles, non-relativistic particles of unit um, of matter, so this m defines matter, and this is minus three a dot over a times rho. This is just the conservation equation for the number of galaxies in, in the volume, ignoring the kinetic motion. So now we have two equations. We can plug the one into the other and get the other Friedman equation. So from these two equations, we can cast them in any form, any other form, keeping two equations in hand. So in particular, for instance, we can take a time derivative of this equation, noting to take the time derivative of rho in the process. Yes? That shouldn't be a zero, yeah. and the differential? Of course. <laughs> I've made an infinitely large mistake. No? Okay, so I can take the time derivative of this equation, combine with this equation, and derive what is called the second Friedman equation. So let me call this one, and I will get the second one, which is that a double dot over a, just the form to cross the equation, is minus four pi g over three, Rho. Scale factor k doesn't appear in here. So we have an equation also for the acceleration or deceleration of the scale factor. And for this gas of galaxies, for instance, we can immediately analyze it. So the energy density of the gas of galaxies is positive, number density times mass per galaxy. <laughs> or rest mass energy per galaxy. So the term on the right for the gas of galaxy is always negative, meaning that this expansion always decelerate, which sort of makes sense because I given, I've, I've made some explosion, I've given all the galaxies some outward um, kinetic energy in this problem, and now the only force acting on the galaxies is gravity which pulls them back. So gravity decelerates them, these galaxies, their own gravity decelerates this expansion. And here I have an expansion for the behavior of a dot. And I'll just make a very quick comment on this expansion. So we actually, we don't need to analyze it in detail to know what the orbit a of t will do for the system. Because in Newtonian dynamics, we understand it just from the initial condition. So for this initial gas of galaxy, remember that k was proportional to minus total energy per particle. And we know what particle orbits do in this kind of system. If the total energy per particle is negative, gravity wins, and it just means that I've launched these particles out with a velocity smaller than what we call the escape velocity. And this means they will just go back. So the orbit in this case, if the total energy is negative and K is positive, these orbits will just bounce back. So even though I started them out, they'll go out, decelerate, and come back without ever shell crossing until we hit some singularity and all our universes 
enclosed one, all the galaxies are one on top of the other. So that is called the closed universe in the GR interpretation of the system. From Newtonian dynamics, these galaxies will begin to expand and then go back to zero. So positive K is negative total energy per particle, and this expansion will go back to itself. Negative K is positive total energy per particle. With tot positive total energy per particle, we've given enough initial kinetic energy to these particles, and they're never going to come back. They have a velocity larger than escape velocity. They'll just go out. And K equals exactly zero means that deceleration will die out, and this expansion will start with some velocity, decelerate, but the galaxies will asymptotically continue to expand forever. Okay, so we don't have to do fancy analysis of this differential equation to know the answer. So let us just, okay, so we, we've, we are done actually. If you have more questions, just stop me at this point because I, now I want to, to move forward with uh, another gear if you want. And so we have this set of equations. Why don't we just apply it to the gas of galaxies and measure what this k is for the system, right? Because as I said, we know the density and we know the initial velocity. We know edge. We know the Hubble rate. So I should, I should just say, add another piece of terminology here, that this quantity a dot over a evaluated at time t naught is nothing but this correlation coefficient Hubble naught that we wrote before. You can check it for yourself, okay? And more generally, now that we have this as a function of time, we say that um, a dot over a at some arbitrary time is defined to be h of t. No longer a Hubble constant, but a Hubble variable if you want. So uniform velocity divergence um, as a function of time. And we've calculated the orbit for this thing. And I'm just doing, doing these definitions to set up some terminology and to use this equation to measure a k for our gas of galaxies from what we see. Okay, so let me write this equation in a common way that it is written. So this equation says that h squared, everything function of t, is 8 pi g over 3 rho minus k over a squared, okay? And there is a convenient way to write this which makes the other quantities that are not explicitly or obviously related to energy densities, we can replace them by a definition of equivalent energy densities by just taking out this factor. So I can just write this as 3 a squared over 8 pi g. Let me call this quantity, well, I won't call this quantity any name right now, but this is rho minus 3k over 8 pi g a squared. I didn't do anything, it's just that I want to replace this quantity here, and I call it as rho minus rho k, the effective energy density associated with the constant k. And this effective energy density is a function of scale factor A, because K itself is just a constant, and it decays as 1 over A squared when A expands, okay? In contrast, this energy density for our gas of galaxy, remember, decays like 1 over A cubed, okay? So when I scroll back time, A becomes smaller. This energy density explodes like 1 over the shrinking A cubed, and the curvature and energy density, or rho K, explodes slower like 1 over A squared, okay? <clears throat> and let's put numbers today. So let me define also a density name for this. So let me define rho c. I define it as 3 h naught squared over 8 pi g, which is called the critical density and I define it today because that's how I like to do it. In other places, you may see it as a function of time, and you know how to evaluate it as a function of time, and just let this thing be a function of time. And it's a measurable density because we know G Newton and we know the Hubble rate. And so now I can put the numbers and I can say <clears throat> that my rho k is equal 
to the gas of galaxies. Okay, let me say for the galaxies. I would infer a rho k, which is equal to the galaxy density, minus what is called the critical density. Let's put numbers and see what this is, okay? Just a little exercise, I'll do it over here. So our rho critical is three edge naught squared over eight pi g. Let's use the magic of uh, CGS units, which says that if you write everything in CGS units, you get an answer in CGS units. So this is three times 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, if you remember. So kilometers is 10 to the five centimeters. Megaparsec is three times 10 to the 24 centimeters. And I want to square this, so this is an object of order of units one over second. And here I have eight pi, and g is 6.7 times 10 to the minus eight in crazy units in CGS, however. So I don't need to say what this is. It's complicated, but the answer is gram per centimeter cube. Okay, trust me on this. And when you put the numbers in this thing, you find an answer that is uh, 10 to the minus 29 gram per centimeter cubed. It's a number for our universe, and it is given just by measuring the velocity at which these galaxies are escaping from us. Okay, so we see the galaxies escape. We have a number for this object, rho critical. Oops. <clears throat> now, what is the density of galaxies? Let me cheat. Instead of density of galaxies, let me calculate the density, the total density of baryons. Okay? We know the total density of baryons better than we know the total mass density of galaxies. I'm telling you an answer that you haven't yet seen the, the derivation of, but it's true. So by galaxies, really, I mean the density of baryons. And I'm really cheating. Density of baryons is higher than the density of galaxies, but that's an aside. Okay? So the total density of baryons, remember that I said in the previous lecture, I gave you this trivia number, that the number density of baryons in the universe is about two times 10 to the minus seven. We did it for electrons. So it was two 10 to the minus seven, electrons per centimeter cubed. But the universe is neutral, otherwise there would be catastrophic um, evolution or catastrophic electrostatic energy density. Well, it's a subtle point, but the universe is neutral. So the density of free electrons is also the density of protons. Okay, so this here should better be the number density of protons today. I'm giving you these numbers to order 10% accuracy. We're just doing estimates here. And the mass density is this number density times the mass of a proton. And the mass of a proton is roughly 1.7 times 10 to the minus 24 gram. So here is the result in gram per centimeter cubed. So this is 3.4. And this is uh, 10 to the minus 31 gram per centimeter cubed. This is the mass density observed to be attached to these baryons that we depict by these galaxies here. Okay, these are observations. And we can take the ratio of this. So rho galaxy, rho baryons, over rho critical today is roughly 0.04, rounding up a little bit. So we've measured K, right? We've measured K. Rho K is the difference, so this rho K should be rho C times rho gal or rho baryon over rho C minus one. We've measured K, it's large, it's order one to rho C, and it's negative. So this is much, much smaller than zero, and you can put the numbers. That's a really nice exercise. And the answer that we got this way is completely wrong, observationally. But before that, questions so far? Okay, so how do we know this is wrong? 
To really explain this will take me too much time. So I'll just skip directly to the answer, essentially of how we know um, that this answer is wrong. Yeah, rho k is of order rho c and negative. Before I do that, let me just define another name, um, which is called the omega parameter. Okay, so all of this I want to keep. This is our board of definitions and Friedman's equations. So let me define in, uh, in the omega parameter. So let me define, for instance, omega b to be the density of baryons divided by the critical density today. And it is really this number that we have measured so reasonably accurately. So this number is of order point or four based on how fast the galaxies recede from us, and the fact that by a miracle, I actually know the density of baryons in the universe, okay? So this is one number that we measured. Notice that I define the omega parameters always as the value of these ratios today. If you want to let these values evolve with time, you can, and then people add the label zero on these omega parameters, and it's easy to do it because you know how this evolves with time and how this evolves with time, okay? But I define it today. And we can define another parameter, omega k, to be rho k over rho c, okay? So on and so forth. So we need this for you to look at the following plot. Good. So this is a plot from uh, the Planck 2015 data release. Planck was a, a cosmic microwave background satellite. Blah, 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 blah. Super state of the art, should be happy. And um, the results uh, in this plot, uh, in, in this plot they're presenting um, their inferred values of two cosmological parameters out of six input cosmological parameters that I leave in the side. And one of these cosmological parameters is called omega lambda. We'll discuss it in, in uh, one minute. And the other is called omega m, okay? This omega m is defined exactly the same way as I defined omega b. The difference between this omega m and my omega b is that omega m is defined to be as the total mass density of matter divided by the critical density today. And the total mass density of matter, as you've seen um, from Javier's talk yesterday, the total mass density, the total mass attached to each galaxy is much, much larger than actually its baryonic content. We measure it in galaxy clusters, we measure it in various ways, galaxy rotation curves tell us something about this. So for my discussion, at this point, it's not very crucial, but the point is, Javier told you that in fact, the total mass density compares to the total baryon mass density by roughly a factor of six. So this is roughly six times omega b, based on observations of clusters, etc. okay? And also, based on other inferences from the CMB and other, and other measures. So this axis is this omega m, and in fact this factor of six, I can just apply directly to the number that we calculated, and it will bring me roughly to 0.24, okay? Somewhere around 0.3. So this omega m should be, from our estimate, something like, let's call it 0.3, okay? So, that's our estimate for omega m, and this number 0.3, or a little below that I'm saying, is basically, you can get it by saying that galaxy clusters <clears throat> measure the dark matter to baryon ratio with reasonable accuracy, and they say that if I multiply the known baryon content by a factor of six, it brings me to an omega, total mass parameter omega of somewhere in here, and this measurement knows essentially nothing on omega lambda, on, on, on the other omega parameters that I define. So clusters, measurements of dark matter say that our universe lives somewhere here. Matter is somewhere here. Now, omega lambda 
from our consideration, will enter as some other form of energy density. Okay, so at this very, at this precise point, let me just say, okay, so let me write here, I wrote total energy density, okay? So let me just say now that the total energy density will be a matter density. It will be the total density of all forms of matter that we know, okay? We essentially know three well-defined forms of matter. We, we can define others. So the first form of matter is just slow-moving particles or galaxies or hydrogen atoms. They all behave the same in, in cosmology. Okay, so this is ordinary matter. Then I could add another form of energy density that I call rho lambda that is related to a cosmological constant. What I mean by a cosmological constant at this point is that simply I take my Lagrangian and I add in my Lagrangian a term that is proportional to some constant, constant C. Quantum field theory tells us essentially nothing about this constant C. We don't know about if you want the ground state of the theory with just quantum field theory, but gravity does care about it. And this constant in the Lagrangian adds to the energy density of the universe in a way that gravity sees. And rho lambda will be the energy density attached to this unknown potential constant in our Lagrangian. Okay, so that's another form of energy that could in principle be there. And another form of energy that we could add is radiation. So by radiation, I mean relativistic particles. Our gas of galaxy was not relativistic. By radiation, I just mean, for instance, the CMB photons themselves. We'll get there shortly, but it is not important for the conditions of the universe as we see them today. Okay, I'll get there in a, in a sec. So bear with me. Imagine that this raw radiation is not important and that in the total density, I am allowed to guess two relevant forms of energy density. One is galaxies and the dark matter moving with them. And the second is, is uh, just a constant in the Lagrangian. And omega lambda for all lambda is defined just in the usual way. So omega lambda is defined to be this rho lambda over rho c. Okay, let me put this up. So these are my omega parameters. And now we can look at this plot from the CMB. So Planck derives this omega mass, the total mass density, and the cosmological constant mass density. And this line that you see here, the dashed black line, is the line at which omega matter and omega lambda are equal to exactly one. Okay? Why one? One, because I can rewrite my Hubble equation, this equation, okay, this we discussed, I'll erase it. So I can rewrite my equations for the Hubble rate in terms of my omega parameters. And in terms of my omega parameters, this is just row critical. So, I divide everything by row critical. That's all I do. Row critical by row critical is one. And on here, I need to divide the energy densities that I wrote over here by row critical. So I have omega matter plus omega lambda plus omega radiation in principle. And as I defined it, it's minus omega k. This is a statement of the state of the universe today. Okay, there is a relation between these quantities from the definitions. So, believing me that omega radiation can be ignored, I'll estimate it in one second over there, believing me that it can be ignored, um, this dashed line just says that the sum of omega lambda and omega m alone is already equal to one, leaving no room for omega k. Omega k needs to vanish. And this is what we call the flat universe, and this is the Planck constraint. <clears throat> So CMB alone doesn't put a very strong constraint on the relation between omega lambda and omega m because there is a degeneracy. Okay, this is a good topic to discuss in the Q&A sessions. I was asked about this yesterday. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but just in two words, the presence of non-vanishing omega k 
distorts the path of light geodesics in the universe. It changes the angular diameter distance, and it makes objects, so for positive k, a closed universe, objects seem to be closer, objects of known size, seem to be closer than they really are. CMB gives us objects of known size, which is structural in the um, um, CMB anisotropies, okay? And so the distance to the CMB anisotropy, the inferred distance for known size of perturbations will be modified by, um, by, the, by, the, by the presence of omega k, okay? And the degeneracy happens because these parameters, a particular combination of them, constrains the distance to where the CMB anisotropies are actually occurring, or being that we are measure are actually occurring, okay, the inhomogeneities that we see as anisotropies are occurring then, and so there is this degeneracy. So the question is, do we have, from the CMB point of view, do we have some omega k, or, or do we actually not know very well the distance to the CMB um, original location, okay? This degeneracy, however, is broken, the degeneracy between distance to the CMB, to where the photons are coming from, and curvature, it's broken if we get another um, standard ruler, another object of known size at a different distance. And we get such a ruler for measuring of clustering of galaxies, okay? And this is the BAO here that you see. And this BAO, when you include it, it basically nails the CMB data alone to sit really very close to the flat universe curve. Okay, so large scale structure, given here in the barren acoustic oscillation, and, um, and the CMB, the total CMB data, really nails this universe, the combination omega lambda plus omega m, to be very, very close to one today, okay? Leaving very little room for omega k. So, from this point on, I'm just going to ignore this omega k, and we know observationally that this omega k in absolute value is smaller roughly than 10 to the minus, maybe few, I'll say 10 to the minus two, to be safe, okay? And we will just ignore it dynamically, it will not be important for us. In other words, even with Javier's dark matter adding a factor of six more mass to each galaxy or to concentrations of baryons, okay? Even with this factor of six over here, our omega matter just reaches about 0.3. And there is strong constraints, so there can be, there is no real room for curvature energy density. So this omega lambda, the other form of matter that we know could be there, has to be large. Has to be about 0.7. Okay, so our gas of galaxies, we've done this analysis, we got this expression, but our gas of galaxy actually fades in the sense that it alone and even the dark matter attached to each galaxy cannot explain completely what we see. We have had to add another contribution to the energy density coming from some presumably cosmological constant or in any way some form of dark energy. Okay, so one thing I owe you right now and I think it's good to do it quantitatively is to show you that omega r is actually not, not important quantitatively. So that is easy. Let's just see what omega r is. So there are two forms of radiation energy density that we know in the standard model. We want omega r, okay? <clears throat> and the most obvious form is, is uh, photons, basically CMB, dominated by CMB cosmologically. So the photon energy density, because it is a black body spectrum, its radiation energy density is known the minute that you give me the temperature of the photons. Okay, the black body spectrum specify this, and the answer is pi squared over 30 per degree of freedom, so times t to the four, that's the energy density in photons times the number of degrees of freedom per photon, and each photon has two polarizations, two transverse polarization, so there is a factor of two in here. And now we can just put numbers in that, okay? Um, but we can, okay, yeah, so, so we can put the numbers, so in fact, 
We can equally well use the number density of these photons roughly. So the number density of these photons, again from black body, is about 412 per centimeter cubed times roughly the energy per photon, which is about three times the temperature of the photon. So this temperature of the photon is 2.7 Kelvin, which is roughly 2.3 times 10 to the minus 4 electron volts, which is 2.3 times 10 to the minus 13 giga electron volts. And this is useful because I can just, instead of this, I can write rho gamma over rho baryons. And this rho gamma over rho baryons is my 400 times 6 times 10 to the minus 13 GeV divided by my old famous 2 times 10 to the minus 7 baryon per centimeter cubed. Okay? And so each baryon is about 1 GeV worth of energy. The mass of the proton is 0.938 GeV to be more, more precise. Okay, so the GeV cancels on both sides. And I have here something like 12. So I'll make this a 10 times 10 to the 3. So that's minus 10. So I get 10 to the minus 3 give or take a few 10%. And you're encouraged to do this calculation in a more straightforward way uh, in your quiet um, room today. So the radiation, the photon energy density today is a tiny fraction, one per mil or so, compared to the baryon density, which itself is just a few percent of the total closure density. So really, we can ignore photons. Now to the second form of radiation. Let's call it one. Second form of radiation that I mentioned so there could be massless neutrinos. Standard model still allows um, one massless neutrino. Their contribution to the energy density we can also compute. And the contribution of neutrinos, the entire set of three neutrinos, to the radiation energy density, even if all of them were relativistic, so this can be shown to contribute rho neutrinos is roughly point seven of the photon energy density. So these guys really don't help much with the standard model parameters. And this is the relativistic expression. If the neutrinos are non-relativistic, they can contribute a little more, but still not a significant amount. OK, so radiation, standard model radiation, is really a small correction to this result. The game today is just lambda and n. OK. So we've analyzed our gas of galaxies. Their mass density, we know their initial conditions. We know the Hubble rate. We know the mass densities. And cosmological data like CMB tells us that CMB and baryon acoustic oscillations combined, and some other data sets tell us that the universe is very close to being flat. So we have a statement on this initial condition. This k is close to 0. Close enough such that the associated curvature energy density is negligible today and at earlier times. And this told us that galaxies, even including the dark matter in them, are far from enough to give us the correct closure density. And so we had to add this kind of cosmological constant from the CMB data. And that is everything I wanted to say at this point about the contents of this universe. So what we wanted to say about the content is summarized in here. So the contribution of our universe, or so the contents of our universe in terms of energy densities. And what I really want to go to now is how, now that we have a pretty good estimate for the forms of matter that contribute to this energy density, I'd like to play with this equation, or with this hub, with equation for the Hubble rate age or for the scale factor A dot, because really I want to push towards the Big Bang, towards the time of a hot and dense universe. Okay? <clears throat> 
So let me summarize what we had. We had the Friedman equation for the Hubble rate, which we can write in terms of the omega parameters. Okay. Um, actually, I will need another step before I move on. Because as I said, we have this inference of the, these omega parameters, non-matter contributions, so omega lambda, for example, to the energy density, and it's not negligible. And in fact, because it's not negligible, I will have to correct one of these equations. So I apologize, give me one minute to correct this equation to include these more surprising forms of energy. Okay, so when we derive this set of Friedman equations, we got initially the equation of energy conservation, and the equation of energy con conservation turns out to be correct, even accounting for all forms of matter of this, uh, uh, that I've written here. So this equation actually requires no modification. These equations, however, relied on the conservation of energy densities of galaxies in a unit coordinate volume. And that's broken. When there is expansion, that is broken for radiation and for cosmological constant. And to see how to correct this equation, I'll just comment that to get this equation, we used this mass conservation equation for matter, but this needs to be generalized a little bit, okay? So actually, let me tell you just how to derive it quickly. So a formula that works and is based on Newtonian thermodynamics, basically, is to point out that if you have a volume filled with substance, okay, some form of fluid, and this volume expands, then we have a thermodynamic equation for the total energy density contained in this fluid. And the differential of the total energy density should be minus P dV, where V is the volume changed, and P is the work done due to pressure. Okay, so P is pressure. Thermodynamic definition of pressure. It just means that your substance, if it contains of particles that are moving fast, your particles are scattering off the wall, and they give some, a certain force density acting on the wall, right? The gas wants to inflate this container if the gas moves with high velocities. And so when the volume expands, the pressure does work. As the gas does work on the volume, on the boundaries, its own energy must be re reduced, okay? Because of this work done by the pressure, and this equation encompasses it, okay? And for our realization of expanding universe, U can be associated with energy density times scale factor cubed. Let's give our volume to be of unit coordinate volume. And V is this A cubed. So in fact, the correct conservation equation for energy generalized to non, to relativistic matter, for example, and other forms of matter, the correct equation is that D times rho A cubed is minus P D A cubed. That turns out to be the correct equation. It actually works even when you have relativistic particles and even if you have a cosmological constant. And if you play with this, you find that this equation needs to be generalized. Okay? And now, the equation will work not only for matter, but also for relativistic matter and other forms of matter. And what I need to do is to add here the pressure. And when you massage it into the second Friedman equation, you find that this is replaced by 3P. So now we have a lightning derivation of the correct set of Friedman equations accounting for cosmological constant and radiation. Let's just play with the physics a bit. So the answer with zero pressure to this conservation equation said that the density in unit coordinate volume is conserved. So for matter, pressure is zero. The galaxies move very slowly. They really exert no force at all uh, or no momentum change when they collide with our imaginary boundary, right? So pressure is zero and energy density is conserved in the unit volume. For radiation, however, The pressure, density, the pressure is a third of the energy density. So for matter, the pressure was zero. For the Asian, the pressure is a third of the energy density. It's, it's an elementary exercise that you can do. So when the pressure is a third of the energy density, 
what we have for the Asian. Um, we have that rho dot is just minus four a dot over a rho. That's for radiation. This means that as the little volume expands, each little relativistic particle inside experiences adiabatic energy loss. Its energy is redshifted. This is what we saw for the photons. The energy is redshifted. So this equation says that in a gas, you already saw when you expand this gas, each photon redshifts by one factor of the scale factor. So that's the energy per particle redshift by one factor of the scale factor. And the number density decreases by the cubed um, um, power of the scale factor. Overall saying that d of rho r a to the four is zero. Okay, so this is what happens for radiation. What about our cosmological constant? Our cosmological constant is put in by hand to satisfy that its energy density is a constant. It does not care about expansion. If you have a little container filled with cosmological constant and you expand it, you just have more <laughs> in there. It does not work, it's just in there. And if you trace back the calculation, this means that the pressure of the cosmological constant is minus the energy density of the cosmological constant. Okay? This is said that rho dot of lambda is zero. But now our expression here is, um, is, is, uh, is general, and we can go back and use it, uh, including all these forms of uh, energy density that we've inferred the universe contains. Okay, so I'll summarize it. <coughs> First, these results over there say <coughs> that raw matter of, let's say, redshift is given by rho matter today times one plus z cubed. Rho radiation is rho radiation today times one plus z to the four. Rho lambda is rho lambda today. We're ignoring curvature. And this means that I can write this Friedman equation as an expression for the Hubble rate h equals to a dot over a. So I have an equation that says that h squared, convenient to make it a function of redshift now, to label time, just writing this equation, is equal to 8 pi, well, okay, 8 pi g over 3 rho lambda plus <clears throat> rho m at z equals zero, one plus z cubed, plus rho r at z equals zero, one plus z to the four, ignoring this term. And I can write it as h of z equal to h naught of z, to h naught, the Hubble rate today at z equals zero, times square root of my omega parameters. Omega lambda plus omega matter one plus z cubed plus omega r one plus z to the four. And that is what I wanted to get to. Oops. And this equation we can now extrapolate back, which is what really we wanted to do, based on what we know that cosmological constant should do, matter should do, and radiation should do, the local measurement of radiation, the local measurement of matter, and this inference of omega lambda. Okay, and this is how fast the galaxies are moving back. Okay, so I'll erase the rest. And move on. So we have this 
Hubble rate. It's a rate because it's in unit of one over time, one over seconds, for instance. It's d by dt of a divided by a. Okay. And we can plot how this Hubble rate must behave when we take our universe and scroll back time. Okay? When we go back in time. Z gets larger than one, than zero. Okay. So we can make a plot. As a function of redshift, let's make a zero here. We can plot how this expansion rate must have behaved. Okay, so we can plot rates. And starting by this expansion rate. So when the redshift is zero, this equation is dominated by a cosmological constant. And so the Hubble rate, when redshift is very close to zero, you can neglect these terms, okay? And you have you know, a 30% correction to this dominance of lambda. This equation says that the Hubble rate is constant. This is an inflationary situation. The Hubble rate is constant. The scale factor is exponentially growing with time. You can work it out for yourself, okay? So today, this Hubble rate is roughly constant as a function of time. Okay, so I'll put the label age later. Now it's just the Hubble rate, remember? We know when, at what redshift, the cosmological constant dominance, as we go back in time, we go to high Z, we can say at what redshift omega lambda becomes unimportant. Quite rapidly, it becomes unimportant. Okay, so there are notable times Notable z's. The first one is the redshift at which this omega lambda becomes unimportant. It's easy to see. So today omega r is unimportant. I can ignore it yet, as of now. And so I can, I can say that these terms are equal at the following redshift. So let's call it 1 plus z lambda cubed is omega lambda over omega m. When we get to this z lambda, the role of dark energy stops as we scroll back in time. It becomes unimportant. And this says that z lambda is of order 0.3. So we have to compress our universe by a factor of 30% in order for the gas of galaxies with the dark matter in them to begin to dominate this equation. Once the gas of galaxy begins to dominate this equation, when the redshift is larger than z lambda, <clears throat> I can drop this omega lambda. I can still ignore this redshift, the radiation. And now the Hubble rate is going to go like the 3 over 2 power of redshift. Okay, so after we cross this point, Hubble rate is going to go like redshift to the 3 halves power. Okay? It's roughly a power law in here. Now we scroll time backwards even more. And eventually, because radiation energy density explodes like redshift to the 4, it's going to take over the matter contribution. So even though today it's negligible, eventually it's going to take over. So this was one redshift of importance. We have another redshift of importance. So you can do the math yourself here. So there is another redshift of importance that is called Z equality. It's the redshift at which matter and radiation energy densities become equal. And it's again given just by omega m over omega r. And if I know the contribution of neutrinos to energy densities, I can get and I observe the energy density of the CMP photons, then I know omega r precisely. And I have these measurements of omega m, so I can calculate. So, okay. One plus this guy is equal to omega m over omega r. And this says that this z equality is roughly 3.4 times 10 to the 3. The second redshift of importance 
put it over here. And now to get here, we've gone a long way. So now to get here, we've compressed this gas of galaxies by a factor of 3,000, okay? It means that each of these systems was closer by a factor of 3,000 to its neighbor than it is today, okay? We've made a series squeezed here and all kinds of things will happen. From a point of view of looking at the Hubble rate, what will happen is that these terms become unimportant. The Hubble rate is now proportional to Z squared. Okay, so it begins to go like Z squared. So the Hubble rate goes like one plus Z squared. And we can write another way. So here is why from the particle physics point, this becomes interesting. So remember the energy of the photons we are saying is also squeezed like one, one plus Z. So instead of writing one plus Z squared, we can use the temperature of the photons as a label. So recall, recalling that the photon temperature is proportional to one plus Z, or oh, it's equal with the temperature today times one plus C, okay? So instead of writing this, I could also say that the Hubble rate is proportional to T squared, and here the Hubble rate is proportional to T to the three halves, okay? And this becomes interesting because it's interesting for us for particle physics point of view, because the rate or the cross sections for um, reactions, particle physics reactions to occur, depends, as you know, on the energy of the initial state. Okay, cross sections depend on the energy of the initial state. Okay, I will have time to work out two examples in my remaining four minutes. So when we say that the expansion rate of the universe, the rate at which the amount of time at which the universe essentially doubles itself, is essentially proportional, or it, it depends with some power law on the typical energies of final state photons that are colliding, or particles that are colliding, <clears throat> we can connect this expansion rate to the rate at which reactions are happening in this volume. Okay, so we have this expanding gas. Oops. It's expanding with a Hubble rate, which is the amount of time it you, you need to double the volume. And in this gas, particles are colliding. Okay, so two photons go into an E plus, E minus pair when they have high enough energy or more relevant for me right now, a photon hits an electron by Compton scattering. Okay. Scattering happens. So it's interesting to compare the rate at which these collisions happen to the rate of the expansion. Okay. Let's do it. So this interaction is a classical, so if I, if I consider, the, let me consider this interaction. When the temperature is high, this interaction, when the temperature is much, much larger than the temperature of the photons today, but nevertheless, the temperature is much, much smaller than the mass of the electron, which is roughly 0.5. MeV. Okay, so remember the temperature of the photons today is something like two tenths to the minus four electron volts. Okay, so to get to a temperature of million electron volts, I have to scroll back time, I have to compress the universe by a factor of 10 to the 10, more or less. Okay, so I'm going to consider this interaction when squeezing the universe by a lot, but not yet by 10 to the 10. Okay, let me erase this part to make it cleaner. So as long as the temperature, the initial energy of these particles is much below the mass of the electron, I can just integrate out this electron propagator, yeah? So I have a classical effective field theory to describe this. And the cross-section for this process is just the Thompson cross-section. And as it must, it's proportional to alpha squared, okay? We have E here, E here. I square it for the cross section. I can integrate out one fermion propagator. So I have one over M E squared. 
You know, there is 8 pi over 3 coefficient, which I don't care about. But it's a constant in this case. This cross-section in this effective theory, at low energy, I just need low energy Compton scattering. This cross-section is independent of energy, actually. The interaction rate, which is the rate at which this reaction happens, is the Thompson cross-section. The interaction rate is the density per photon, yeah? Is the density of electron targets times the cross-section times C, okay? Now, the density of the electrons, number density is just expanding like a, like a cubed. Okay, so the density of these electrons is essentially proportional to one plus Z cubed, just tracing expansion. So this whole reaction rate goes like redshift cubed, or in other words, so this is proportional to the photon temperature cubed, okay? So this reaction rate is proportional to alpha squared T cubed over M E squared, and the important thing, it's proportional to T cubed. So I can plot it in here. Okay, last thing I'll do today, or oh, this session. So I can plot this reaction rate. And we know that today we've done this exercise. This, this uh, scattering rate is much, much, much smaller than the current age of the universe, or roughly one over age naught. This is an exercise that we have done already. Okay? So we know that this reaction starts up somewhere here. However, as we scroll back time, this interaction rate shoots up like temperature cubed. Okay, so, oops. This guy here was the Hubble. And our interaction rate starts small and grows big very fast. So it starts somewhere here, and then it's growing big, and I will do it dashed very fast. Let's call it gamma QED is proportional to T cubed at this stage. Okay? So I will finish this discussion in the next lecture, and then move on to more advanced things or some of the implications of this before. The point is that what happens when the scattering rate exceeds the Hubble rate <clears throat> is that suddenly there are very few reactions per universe time scale, and here there are very many, universe, uh, very many interactions per universe time scale, per expansion time scale. So in here, these interactions are fast, and there will be thermal equilibrium. Well, I would say interactions fast. We'll discuss implications later. Interactions fast and slow relative to the Hubble rate. And if we would really follow this naive exercise, we can easily calculate this redshift by equating this rate to the Hubble rate. And the answer we would get is about 100. And this is sort of what we went, what I meant when I said that expansion solves the problem of the CMB black body spectrum because we are seeing that as we squeeze the Hubble, as we squeeze expansion backwards, interactions become, the, the, the photons have many, many interactions in this epoch, they can reach a black body spectrum. And just to finish, I'll just say, this answer of redshift of order a few hundreds that we get is completely wrong, but it gives the correct picture. And my goal in the next lecture, in the first 20 minutes, is to derive the correct answer. Um, for this redshift, it turns out to be a redshift of about 1,000, so just before the redshift of equality, but above the redshift of order 100 that you would get if you just equate this term directly to the Hubble rate. Okay, so I think I should, I should finish.